Welcome to Policy on Demand. I'm Nini Dewar. We're filming this episode from PwC International Tax Conference where, not surprisingly, we're talking about regulatory developments. Joining me today to discuss the latest on that front are Wade Sutton and Aaron Jung. Wade and Aaron, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Okay, so we got a lot of guidance in the recent um, months and foreign tax credit is one where we got a guidance on um, a few things. One on the interaction with Pillar 2 and also on creditability. So Aaron, could you get into that and talk about the implications? Yeah, yeah. So we got a notice, right, um, in December and it addresses, like you said, a few things. One of the things it addresses is kind of partial guidance for the treatment of Pillar 2 taxes for U.S. foreign tax credit purposes. And what it's primarily focused on is taxes imposed under things like an income inclusion rule or an IAR, where you've got a foreign country imposing a top-up tax, but that top-up tax is reduced for taxes further up the chain. So think about you've got a U.S. multinational. It's got a foreign holding company subsidiary underneath that. The holding company is subject beginning in 2024 to an income inclusion rule with respect to low tax profits down below but the top-up tax is reduced for any U.S. guilty cost imposed at the ultimate parent level. That's kind of squarely in the crosshairs of this notice. And, and what it says is there's no U.S. foreign tax credit for those taxes, and there's also no deduction for U.S. tax purposes. And, and the way that happens is either you can't take a deduction on the U.S. tax return, or if the taxes are imposed at the CFC level, you have a, a, a gross-up that kind of neutralizes the, the effect of the tax uh, or the effect of the deduction. I mentioned, though, it's, it's only partial guidance, right? So there's still a bunch of issues out there left unanswered in, in regards to Pillar 2 taxes, things like what do you do with UTPRs or under tax profits rules, and also what do you do with things like voluntary payments, the, the U.S. kind of compulsory payment rules. Um, those are still unanswered, and so that's, that's going to be subject of future guidance, hopefully. And, and do you think the, the guidance gives us anything about what we might expect, like for UTPR and other ones? I, I think it's I think it's um, it's a great question. I, I think it's hard to say. So you could read this and make an inference that um, Treasury and the IRS think a UTPR is just not a credible tax in the first place. Um, but it does kind of set up a, an odd dynamic where maybe UTPRs and IARs are treated differently, and why should they be? So I think there's more to be said on that story, to be honest with you. The other thing to add about the notice is that there's a continued deferral of the final regulations on foreign tax credits that, as we all know, that those were very controversial, a lot of taxes that people would have thought were clearly creditable, there were some serious doubts about. And so rather than try and do these iterative one-off fixes to those regulations, last summer the Treasury Department and IRS said, you know what, just defer applying those final regs. We're going to continue to work on these, but we're going to give you, it was a two-year deferral. Um, I think they quickly realized that that was a very short period. It was almost over before the relief started. And um, so they basically kicked the can down the road indefinitely on, on not having to apply those final rules. You can go back to the old sets of rules and apply those instead. And I think most of my clients are just very happy with that as a status quo. Like, why don't you stop here? This is good enough. You still are going after DSTs. Those are not creditable. Uh, what we're hearing from the government, though, is that they are continuing to look at this space, and maybe in the medium term you could expect to see something. Um, so we'll just kind of wait and see what happens there. Right. But at least for now, it's a good news on the creditability front. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's move on to the dual consolidate loss guidance. I think in the very same notice that we got the FTC guidance, we also got the DCL, a dual consolidated loss, and the interaction with Pillar 2. So wait, what can you tell us about that. Yeah, well, to start, the dual consolidated loss rules, or DCL rules, as we refer to them, very complex. I'm going to try to do a simple version for policy on demand, but they're aimed at preventing double dips of a single deduction in two countries. And so that often happens where you might have a U.S. disregarded entity with expenses, and that disregarded entity files a foreign consolidated tax return. And so if you have expenses in that entity, you might be able to deduct them in two places. And Generally, the rules prevent that by ensuring you can only deduct against income earned by that entity. So people have lived with those rules for quite a while and, and have known how to navigate them. They're very complex. The wrinkle is that Pillar 2 comes in and it's calculated on a jurisdiction-wide basis, which is effectively 
mandatory consolidation. And so there are a lot of concerns that, hey, if I have a loss in, say, a disregarded identity under the U.S., and that's being taken into account for Pillar 2 purposes, and I've got a CFC with income, do I have what's called a foreign use? And, and that's the sort of thing that can prevent you from being able to deduct the losses in the U.S., or if you've already deducted them, you might have to recapture them with an interest charge. And so thankfully the notice provided relief, but really limited relief. It was just for what are called legacy DCLs, which are losses incurred in 2023 with some special rules for fiscal uh, non-calendar year ends. Um, and what we know is they're studying this space. It's a live concern for 2024. So for places with QDMTTs in effect, and there's a handful of countries that that describes, we're kind of waiting to see what happens. And so I think uh, certain taxpayers have this issue with very large numbers behind it, and they're watching this space you know, like a hawk because it's very material to their profits or their financial results. And still a lot of uncertainties, I guess, around what is foreign news. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's switch gear to alternative minimum tax, um, Camp T. Uh, we got a notice as well, which I think is a helpful one, dealing, um, among others, with the distribution from CFC. So, Aaron, what can you tell us about the practical impact of that? Yeah, very helpful guidance. Um, so, AMT, right, the, the focus is kind of the, the book income, right, of a multinational group. And there has been a question since enactment about what do you do with dividends kind of going through the chain? Do those you know, potentially get counted multiple times? For regular tax purposes, a lot of times um, those earnings have already been subject to either U.S. tax or foreign tax or both, and so they don't get taxed again when distributed. What do we do for alternative minimum tax purposes? Very helpfully what the notice says is in general, and there, there's some kind of conditions there, but in general, follow your regular tax treatment. Right? So if you've got a dividend from a CFC and for regular tax purposes, you're going to claim a dividend received deduction at the shareholder level with respect to that, then that's what you do for, for um, alternative minimum tax purposes. If it's lower in the chain and it's between CFCs, but you're going to claim an exclusion for regular tax purposes, do the same thing here. Um, I think that makes a ton of sense, both from a, just an administrative perspective, but also from a policy perspective. It's what a lot of taxpayers and, and practitioners were really hoping for, but not what everyone had been requesting. There had actually been comment letters and reports out there suggesting much more complicated approaches um, that, frankly, I don't think would have served the policy or administration very well at all. Um, so I, I think as a practical matter, where this notice applies, which is most distributions from, from foreign subsidiaries, not all, but most, um, I think it provides a lot of relief. What I do encourage folks to do, though, is keep an eye out for what could be coming down the pike because this is just a notice, right? And we fully expect to be getting kind of holistic proposed regulations this calendar year, uh, including on this topic. And I, I certainly hope that they continue this approach, but if they take any different approach, that's, that's where folks are going to keep an eye out for it. Right. So stay tuned on that. Yeah. So before we wrap, um, I want to take a look ahead and ask the question around what can we expect on international guidance? Maybe wait. Yeah, there, there's a lot. So I'll, I'll just come up with a list and please fill in where I miss. But I'm personally very interested in the cloud computing regulations, which we are told could be any time this year. Um, what, what we know is that you know this deals with provision of cloud computing and how those transactions are characterized. That set of proposed regulations will be finalized. But to me, the more interesting piece is we're also hearing that there may be a sourcing package for how to source that income. There's really no specific rules in this space, so this will be a first, um, and so that'll be interesting to watch. I, I hesitate to say it, but PTEP, the rumor is right around the corner. We've been saying this for what, four or five years? Yeah, <laughs> so, it's always six months away. Yeah. Uh, right, so. This year, at some point. <laughs> exactly, um, so maybe we'll see those. Um, that'll be interesting. I, there are rumors that's a very complex, big, hard package. Um, Finalization of 987, the foreign currency branch regulations, that'll be interesting to watch. And then you mentioned some of the IRA guidance. I think we're hearing that that could be pretty close as well. Um, so, you know, stock excise tax, I think particularly for foreign parent companies, that's a really interesting issue who are very focused on the funding role. Or, um, you know, if you're a U.S. multinational, you don't actually have to pay that tax until there is guidance out. And so. 
I think they're kind of enjoying the fact that there isn't any for the moment. Um, and then Campty, you know, there's quite a few unanswered issues. Awesome. Okay, great. Very helpful. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Great being here. Thank you for joining us. Take care.